Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to FICC. Amen. Amen. Why don't we all stand and let's get our bodies warmed up and let's get ready for our worship this afternoon. Amen. 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 What a beautiful day. There's no rain. It's not that cold. I'm so thankful that I'm able to see all you guys in this room here just worshiping and, um, and worshiping our Lord this afternoon. So let's go ahead and start our, um, our, uh, our songs for the Lord this afternoon. Let's make a joyful noise in this room. Come on. I'm casting my cares aside. I'm leaving my past behind. I'm setting my heart and mind on you, Jesus. Amen. I'm reaching my hands to yours, believing there's so much more. Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I won't worry about tomorrow. Trusting in what you say. Today is the day. Oh, oh, oh. Today is the day, amen. Come on, church. I'm leaving my fears aside. I'm leaving my doubts behind. I'm giving my hopes and dreams to you. Yes, Jesus, amen. I'm reaching my hands to yours. Believing there's so much more. Knowing that I'm Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I won't worry about tomorrow. Trusting in what you say. Today is the day. Amen. Today is the day. God, Father, here we are, Lord. We come from the business of our lives at home and our work. Lord, Father, we come here to worship you in this hour. We long to meet you, Father, to feel your presence surrounding us, enveloping us and loving us, Lord. We long to settle into your holiness, Lord, laying aside our worries and our cares. Father, aware of your presence around us, before us behind us and within us, Lord. Would you send your Holy Spirit just to be with us? We know that many of us carry so much in our hearts and our minds that are just completely shutting you out. 
But Lord Father, I pray that you would just take all of these things and just lay them by that door out there. That you would also bind Satan away from this room right now so that we may be able to hear your words clearly, wholeheartedly, that it may pierce our very souls, Lord. That you would just touch us and answer our prayers for the questions that we long to be answered, Lord. Father, we give thanks to you. We praise you in this place. And in his mighty name, we all said, amen. amen. Why don't we make a joyful noise in this room? Amen. amen. God is so good, amen. I am so grateful for him. Yes. Let's make a joyful noise. Put our hands together. Put a smile on your face. Come on. This is the day that you have made. Whatever comes, I won't complain. Amen. For all my hope is in your name. And now your joy awaits my praise. Come on, church. I give thanks. I give thanks for all you have done. Of your mercy and your love, your love is a failing. Lord, I am grateful. Lord, we're so grateful for the day that you have made for every single person that is here this afternoon. Amen. When I was down, you brought me out. You set my feet on higher ground. Yes, you did, Lord. So here I stand, you are my God, his faithfulness, my solid rock. Come on church, I give thanks. I give thanks for all you have done, and I will sing of your mercy and your love. Your love is unfailing, Lord I am grateful. I give thanks for all All the battles you have won, your love is unfailing. Lord, I am grateful. Come on, church, let's get those hands going. Let's keep our bodies warm. Come on. Bring our worship. Come on. And as we lift our hands up, heaven's open, heaven's open. Let our lives declare the love our God has spoken over us. And as we lift our hands up, heaven's open, heaven's open. So let our lives declare the love our God has spoken over us. We're so grateful, amen. amen. I give thanks for all you have done. Yes, Lord. And I will sing of your mercy and your love. Your love is unfailing. Lord, I am grateful. I give thanks. Give thanks for all you have done. I won't forget all the bad. Your love is unfailing, Lord, I am grateful, Lord, I am grateful, amen, yes, God is so good, how many times has he saved you this week, amen, amen, amen. you know, we go through so much, not just at home, but also at work. You know, the devil is just willing to break us, to kill us. But you know what? God is always there for us. Amen. I'm so grateful that he pulled me out of the shadows, out of the dark valleys that I went through this week. God is so good. Amen. Amen. All right, church, let's continue our singing this afternoon.
God is our cornerstone, amen. He is our hope. Sing with us.
Yes. Praise you, God. Praise you, God. Yes. Lord Father, we're nothing without you. Lord God, our Father, we believe. We believe that you answer our prayers whenever we need you, God. How many times you pulled us out of that valley. Lord Father, that's why we're here. To say that we believe in you. Church, lift up your voices. Believe in Jesus. 
Thank you, Lord Father, for your love and your time this afternoon, Lord. Father, we come to you this afternoon offering you our hearts and our soul, Lord. Would you just touch and open up our minds that we would be open to hear your words. Yes, Jesus. That you would bless every heart and every single person that is represented here this afternoon. Yes, Lord. For we know the enemy is waiting to take us and just keep us sidetracked from listening to you, Lord. Would you bless Pastor this afternoon as he delivers his message? Yes, Jesus. Lord, Father, thank you so much for this wonderful day that you have anointed Every person in this room has a purpose, Lord, and you've made it so that we are here. Yes. So, Lord, Father, make that known to us, this mm. purpose that you've given yes. us. Yes. Help us hear these words that it may mm. change our lives and our yes. souls. That it yes. may give us the blessing that you would fill our cups, ready to move on for the week. Yes. Father, we give thanks mm. to you. We bless your name in this place. In the mighty na mightiest name of our Lord Jesus Christ, yes. our church said, Amen. 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 Let us remain standing as we uh, have our offertory prayer. Let's bow our head in prayer. Abba, we thank you, Lord, that in Mark eleven twenty four you said, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Father, thank you so much, Lord, that your will for us is just a prosperous life, a blessing-filled life. A life, Father God, that's full of lessons and growth. Mm. And I pray, Father, right now that it would be in each and every single member standing here before you, Lord, that you will use us and it will be our desire, Father, to tithe but also give back, not just financially, but also our times and our talents to your kingdom, Father yes, God. Yes. And that we will use 110% of the God-given um, gifts that you have given us to yes. further and edu um, edify your kingdom, Father God. So I pray right now, Lord, that um, you will quill and, and remove any worries, um, whether it's financial, whether it's relationship, whether it's um, school or work, Father, I pray that you will just remove those worries. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will come, yes. Father God, and just give us peace, Lord. Mm -hmm. And so we just ask all these things, Lord, and that you will just bless each and every giver for the kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let us all rise and let us sing the doxology. Good afternoon to all of you. Praise the Lord for we are all here. We have a nice weather. It's sunshine outside, not raining, not too cold, not too warm. Amen. Praise the Lord. And uh, those of you who have come here for the first time, we would like to welcome you. But later we will uh, acknowledge you personally. But we praise the Lord that uh, you are here today. All of us are here today. And we believe that God is here. The Bible says that where two or three are gathered in his name, 
Jesus promised, there I am in the midst of them. So we may not see him with our naked eyes, but we believe that Jesus in the person of the Holy Spirit is here with us. Amen? So expect that God will speak to you today because he's here. And we plan to finish, in fact, we are still along the way, our sermon series entitled, David, a man after God's own heart. Did you know that, that uh, there's only one person in the Bible that God said, this person is a person in, that is in accordance to my own heart. And that's David. It's Acts chapter 13, verse 22 in whom also God gave a testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. But I believe that uh, it's not only David, it's not only David that God wants to, to uh, reign supreme in his heart. I believe that God wants every one of his children you and me, every woman, every man here in this room to become a person after his own heart. The problem is, how? How can I, can I be uh, living a life that is in accordance to God's heart? And that's the reason why we're studying David. Because, you know, David is just like, like us. Hmm? He made a lot of boo-boo <laughs> in his life. <laughs> and he's not perfect. And because of that, uh, it makes him just like we. But there's something different about David that uh, whom God has, uh, has said these words. Because David was willing to submit himself to God and to follow his will and to turn away from his mistakes, his, his sin. And so we're now on this uh, series. We're continuing this series, and I've entitled it, no wonder it's called Amazing. And uh, this uh, message today is found in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 to 13. And so in order to give you a background of what we're talking about here, let, let, me, let me just uh, share with you what's going on in these verses as we read them together. Uh, you cite and see, and I'll read it aloud. Second Samuel, chapter 9, verses 1 to 13. One day, David asked, is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? He summoned a man named Ziba, who had been one of, the, one of Saul's servants. Are you Ziba? The king asked. Yes, sir, I am, Ziba replied. The king then asked him, is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. Ziba replied, yes, one of Jonathan's son is still alive. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. In Lodebar, Ziba told him, at the home of Machir, son of Emil. So David sent for him and brought him from Machir's home. His name, is, his name was Mephibosheth. He was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. When he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. David said, greetings, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. Don't be afraid, David said. 
I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, Who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and servants are to farm the land for him to produce food for your master's household. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will eat here at my table. Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Ziba replied, Yes, my lord the king, I am your servant and I will do all that you have commanded. And from that, from that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table like one of the king's own sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah. From then on, all the members of Ziba's household were Mephibosheth's servant, servants. And Mephibosheth, who was crippled in both feet, lived in Jerusalem and ate regularly at the king's table. May God bless the reading of his word. <coughs> so that's the story. That's the story that we're going to deal with this afternoon. But before that, let me share with you a true story that happened. Many years ago here in America, the story is about Fiorello LaGuardia. Must be uh, named. He was this the, the 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 airport was named after this guy because he was mayor of New York, LaGuardia. During the Great Depression, World War II. And he's a, he's, a, he's a guy who, who does not want to just to stay in the office. He was a mayor, but he wants to visit all around uh, New York. So one night he was visiting the, the poorest area in New York. And he went to inside the, the courthouse, the courtroom. And he said to the judge who was sitting there, okay, you can go home now. I can sit on the bench for a while. You know, I think mayors can do that before. So he sat there for, for a while, but after a few minutes, um, there was an old woman was brought before him who was charged of stealing a loaf of bread. And so she, cho she told uh, LaGuardia that her daughter's husband deserted her and that her daughter was sick, and that her two grandchildren are dying of hunger. So that's the reason why he, she stole a loaf of bread. But the shopkeeper or the store manager was telling, because he's putting charges against this woman, said, you know, this is really a real bad neighborhood, your honor. She got to be punished. In order to teach the people who live around, teach them a lesson. And so LaGuardia felt so bad about this. And he turned to the woman, I've got to punish you because that's the law. I've got to punish you. That's the law. And the law, uh, the, the law does not make any ex exceptions. So that will be $10 or 10 days in jail. But while he was saying that, 
he was uh, uh, getting something from his pocket. And he took out the $10 and said, here is the $10 fine, which now I remit. And furthermore, he said, I'm going to, to fine everyone in this courtroom 50 cents for living in a town where a person has to steal bread so that she can feed her grandchildren. Mr. Bailiff, collect the fine and give them to the defendant. That was a big news during that time. And they were collect and, and, and he was able to collect $47.50 <coughs> and it was given to the woman. It's amazing. And that's the essence of grace. And that's what we're going to talk about today. It recognizes our wretched desperate condition. It pays the debt of what we owed. And it gives more than we could ever have imagined. That's grace. And no wonder it's called amazing. It's amazing. The grace. And the passage that we just read today provides us a very good example, one of the clearest picture of amazing grace that is found in the Word of God. So God uses David as a living picture or living illustration of what grace is all about. And we would like to study this because many people have a wrong concept of grace. They thought grace is like a person who lives next door, no? Or that person who's my classmate in school. <laughs> grace. But grace is a special meaning in the Bible. And we're talking about God's grace. And it's always called amazing grace. Well, let's go back to our story. God's amazing grace. First, amazing grace is extended or was given. And there's a reason for this. The first reason for this grace is this. David said that he wants to show kindness for Jonathan's sake. You know, grace has a, or kindness is translated in the Bible as goodness, mercy, or favor, or loving kindness. It is the Old Testament equivalent of the New Testament word grace. Grace is often defined as unmerited favor, unmerited love of God towards persons who are undeserving. Things that are given to person who does not deserve to be given, that's grace. And so what, what, what we have here is David, who would like to extend grace to a member of Saul's family. It's amazing because in light of the fact that during those times, during those days, when a new, new king came to power, he usually destroyed every member of the family of the old king, of the previous king, in order to prevent any rebellion from the family. That's what it is. And so David wants to show kindness to the family of the previous kingdom to the family of Saul, who was his mortal enemy, who tried to kill him, who tried to uh, uh, destroy him. He has all the right to do this, to take revenge, as we have said previously. He was the king. He can execute the judgment. But what he did, he chose to demonstrate grace instead. He did it not, not because 
not because somebody deserved it, not because the soul's uh, family deserved it, but because of his relationship with Jonathan. Jonathan was his friend. And he promised that he's going to uh, protect Jonathan's family. So no wonder this is an amazing thing that David did. And God has extended his grace to members of anybody of the human race, not because we deserve it, but because of another person. We do not deserve grace. We deserve justice. <laughs> hmm? would, you like to, would, you, would you rather receive justice than, than grace? Well, justice means to give you something that you deserve. Yeah? Okay? And the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, it also says that for the wages of sin is death. All of us are sinners. The justice of God says for the wages of sin is death. Would you rather receive justice? Death? That's what the Bible says. In fact, in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, it says, The person who sins shall die. But instead of God's justice, God wants to give us grace. God extends his amazing grace to us, not because we deserve it, but because of another person, because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Neither you nor I have anything to merit God's grace. But because of Jesus, because of what he has done for us, we can receive God's grace. No, no wonder it's called amazing. John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 12. I am writing to you who are God's children because your sins have been forgiven Amen. through Christ. Not through your own effort. Not through your own uh, struggle or ability to make yourself good. But through Christ. Ephesians 4.32 says, God through Christ has forgiven you. So that's the reason for this grace. God wants to show kindness to us. Not because we deserve it. But because of what Christ has done for us. Secondly, let's look at the reach or the extent of this grace. According to verse 1, said that he is looking for any that is left in the house of Saul. Any. David did not place any limits on who will receive that blessing. He was willing to extend it to any member of the house of Saul. That's what it says. So the key word here is any. David was not looking for people that will meet certain criteria or certain qualities. But anyone who was in the, of the family of Saul was a candidate for grace. I thank God for God's amazing grace. And it knows no boundaries. It extends to all men. Regardless of their past. Regardless of their race. Regardless of their social status. Or whatever they have done. God does not, does not reach out to save specific people. The Bible never said that I'm going to... Love only the specific people when I'm not going to love the others. I'm going to extend grace only for this chosen few of mine. He extended the same love, the same grace to all people. Remember John 3.16? For God so loved the world. That's the extent of God's love. 
That's the extent of God's grace. It covers all of us. Mark chapter 2 verse 12, 17 says, Jesus said, I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. If you think you're righteous, if you think you're good enough to go to heaven, then Jesus cannot save you. Jesus will not save you. Because the purpose of Jesus is to save sinners. John 7, 37 says, Anyone who is thirsty can come to me. In other words, it's open for everybody. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy laden, heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Praise God that there is no limit on who can come. But grace is extended to all who will. That's how you and I got in. And if you are here tonight or today and you don't know whether or not you are in, then that's how you can get in as well. It's not through your own goodness. It's not through your own uh, obedience to uh, rules and regulations of the church or the religion, but it is through the grace of God. See, no one deserves it, but all can have it. That's the extent of grace. That's what makes grace so amazing. There's a story of a man, a true story of a man. His name is uh, Mel Trotter. He was an alcoholic person. Again and again, he tried to promise his wife that he will never drink again. But he always break, break his promise. He, was, he tried his best to overcome this bad habit. He squandered all his money. He sold many of his properties just for rounds of drinks. One night, his wife and his little boy were at home, and he came home, and that little boy was sick. And again, he promised his wife that he would never drink again. Two hours later, he was back in the bar. Finally, he came home, and he found his son dead. He died. He said, I can't stand it. This is all my fault. I neglected my own family. I kept drinking and drinking. So he put his arms again to his wife and swore by the ba baby's coffin during the, the funeral that he will never touch a drop of wine again or alcohol again. You know what happened? Two hours after the funeral, he was back drinking. Could not stop. He was addicted. And so he tried to commit suicide. That's just all I can do. I can't. I'm, I'm powerless to do this. But while he was walking, he passed by the door of a, a, a mission group called Pacific Garden Mission. And Harry Monroe, who was himself had been an alcoholic, was leading the singing. So because he heard the singing, he came inside, he was welcomed, and Montrose, uh, Mon uh, Harry Monroe shared his testimony and how God, through Christ, has changed him. And Mel listened, and he believed. And then he trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. He, he, he didn't, he can, he, 
He thought that he was hopeless. But he found hope in Christ during that night. And so he went back again and back again and, and studied the word of God. And, and started growing in his Christian life. And he never touched a glass of wine anymore since that time. And he grew up and three years later, he was asked to head a rescue work in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And he went on and found a chain of missions throughout the United States to help men like himself who could not escape the slavery of alcoholism. Addiction to alcoholism and even to drugs. What made the difference? He tried his best to, his best to change, but he could not. But the difference is this, that he has somebody greater and stronger and more powerful than him who helped him overcome this. He trusted Jesus as his Savior and went on to follow Jesus as his Lord. That's the difference. And it's all because of the grace of God. No wonder it's called amazing. And then what was the response of this grace? You know, David was told, going back to David, David was told that one of Jonathan's son was still alive. Okay? Because he was looking, is there any relative of, jo of, of Saul? And then he was told that one of Jonathan's, which is Saul's son, is still alive. He also heard the, the news that this man is crippled. Yet, the response of grace is not to ask, uh, what kind of man is this? It's not to ask, uh, how bad is this being crippled? Grace is not concerned about a man's background or surroundings or his abilities or his appearance or even his future, future potential. The response of grace is this. Where is he? Hmm? Where is he? I want to show grace. I want to show kindness to him. And soon, as soon as David heard this, he sent his servant to fetch this man. Grace said, I'm not really concerned about his condition. I want him and I'll take him just as he is. And that's the thing. Some people think that, oh, I, I, I don't want to go to church right now. I need to shape up first. Huh? I, I need to clean up my act first. I need to clean up my life first before I can, you know, uh, start uh, praying, before I start coming to church, before I start reading the Bible. No. With grace, you can come just as you are. It is God's responsibility. This is the, God's work to change you, to clean you up. And to make you the kind of person that he wants you to be. So that's the response of this grace. Where is he? I want to take him just as he is. And so it is also true with the amazing grace of God. He does not look upon us and concern himself about how crippled spiritually we are. He looks upon us through the eyes of grace, and he sees exactly what we are. But he loves us in spite of what we are. He knows all about you. He knows all about your past. He knows all about your problems, your potential. Yet he responds by drawing us to himself anyways. No wonder it's called amazing. No wonder it's called amazing. But let's look at the second part. 
Amazing grace is embraced. With a kind of grace like this, that has been manifested before you, all you can do is just to embrace this grace. So wonderful. Just like what happened to Mephibosheth. He was offered a restoration of all the, the, the blessings of the family of Saul. You know, this, this guy, aside from he's just crippled, he was so poor. Perhaps he was eating uh, not the ordinary kind of food, but it's the poorest of the foods. But this was offered to him to be uh, the kindness, the kindness that, that David wants to offer him is the kindness that he will experience goodness and provision. The restoration of all the property, all the riches. Okay? And aside from that, David offered hmm, being able to sit at the king's table. That's the icing on the top of the cake. And so Mephibosheth, all he can do as he entered the presence of grace is to embrace, embrace it, accept it. Accept it how? With a humble heart. With a humble heart. When he comes to the, to David's, into David's presence, he, was, he is aware as a descendant of Saul that he deserved nothing but judgment from the king. And therefore, he humbled his heart. He humbled himself in the presence of David. Secondly, he embraced grace with a happy heart. Okay? I'm sure you two will be happy to be offered something like this. Instead of judgment, judgment, Mephibosheth experiences tenderness. He hears David call his name. Then in his amazement, he hears David speak peace to his heart. He was so afraid he might get, you know, he might get punished, he might get uh, killed. Because he was part of Saul's family, a mortal enemy of David. But he hears the king as he promises him restoration of all the wealth and glory that once belonged to the family of Saul. He was given a wonderful uh, gifts. And so happily, he, uh, he accepts it. And at the same time, he embraced grace with an honest heart. An honest heart means he acknowledged that he was undeserving of such love and mercy. Grace has been extended and it has been embraced and nothing will ever be the same in the life of Mephibosheth again. What a wonderful picture of lost sinner who encounters grace. Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You may not, you may not think that you are uh, not bad enough. Hmm? I'm not like my, my neighbor who is worse. Yes, I'm a sinner, but he's worse than me. <laughs> but the Bible says that If anybody tries to obey the whole commandment, the, whole, all, uh, the, the commandments, and yet offends in one, he is guilty of all. So in other words, all of us are in equal footing with, 
when we face God because we are all sinners. And we must honestly accept that we cannot receive the grace of God unless God decides to give it to us. We must acknowledge our undeserving uh, situation to receive such love and mercy. You can think back and remember that day when as a lost sinner you were brought by the Spirit of God into the presence of God. I remember myself. You know, I grew up in a religious family. I was a good boy. I tried to obey my parents all the time. Some of you know this. I shared your, my testimony with you. And so I thought that I was already okay. Because I go to church every Sunday. I read the Bible. I was taught how to pray during the Sunday school. I attended Sunday school. I did not realize that I need to make a choice to accept Jesus into my heart. Can you realize that I am, I was a pastor's son. My father was the pastor of the church. And here am I, the son of the pastor, who's not even sure whether or not if I die tonight, I'm going to heaven. And so one day, a friend of mine came, to, came and approached me and told me about, you know, God, about Christ. You know. And I thought to myself, I knew everything he said. I know <laughs> that. Because of my background, you know, anak pa nga ako ng pastor. Right? My father was a pastor. But there's one thing that he said. He said that true Christianity is not following rules and regulations. True Christianity is not uh, a religion. No? We thought Christianity is a religion. He said true Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship with Christ. You might have a religion, but you might not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So when I think back, I thought I was saved already because I go to church every Sunday, but no. I need to realize that I am a sinner and that I need Christ in my heart. And when his grace is embraced like this, when you accept Jesus as your Savior and as your Lord, everything changes. Everything changes. No wonder it's called amazing. This amazing grace is also expanded. What does it mean? Expanded. Because the grace that was provided is provi provided uh, a future. See? It was not just restored for him for this, uh, uh, his daily living. But uh, this grace that was given to him also provided for his future. So what, what, what was that uh, done? Did they restore everything, property? And, and David even asked the servants to to uh, take care of the, the land and plant so that his family, himself, and the, the servants will have enough food. All of his present needs were met and his future was secured. And the same is true for all those who experience God's saving grace. God meets our needs. God also thinks about the future. We are promised security. 
John chapter 10, verse 28 says, My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. And no one shall be able to snatch them from my hand. That's security. Right? You were given eternal life through Jesus Christ. If you have Christ in your heart, then you have eternal life. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. And the Bible says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. It's not that when you wake up and you wake up, you walk up in heaven and say, ah, meron pala ako eternal life. No? I didn't realize I have eternal life because you woke up in heaven. No, that means, it means that while here on earth, while you are still living here in, on earth in Fredericksburg or in Stafford or wherever you live, you can be sure, you are already sure that you have eternal life because Christ has given you that life. That's what the Bible says, you shall never perish hmm? and no one shall be able to snatch you away from my Father's hand. That's security. We are also promised the future in heaven. You know, when Jesus Christ was here on earth, he told his disciples, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm coming again. Hmm? So that where I am, there you shall be also. And if you are a believer, if you know that you have a personal relationship with Christ, this is God's, this is God's promise for you. That you have a special place being prepared for you in heaven. You haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. But I know it's great. Because Jesus is preparing that place. So if you were to die tonight, the question is for you to answer, are you sure you're going to that place? Or you're not sure? Or maybe, or there's a good chance I'll go there. <laughs> or, you can. But I'm telling you right now, you can be sure. The Bible tells us that you can be sure. Jesus himself gave that assurance to his disciples. But at the same time, while we are still here on earth, Jesus promised that he will provide all our needs. Okay? That's the reason why we're still here on earth, so that we can serve him, and so that he can show us how wonderful and marvelous his provision is to us. The Bible says in Philippians 4.19, My God will supply all your needs according to the riches that is in Christ Jesus. What a tremendous promise. He will supply all your needs. He didn't say he will supply all your wants. Hmm? I want this, I want that. No. It says your needs. That's, God, that's what God promised. And it's in accordance to, to the riches that is in glory, that is in Christ. And then we are promised that he will not leave us alone. He will always be with us. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Has any, has any parent or friend promised you that promise? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Only Jesus Christ promised that. And he promised his disciples, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So grace provided a future. 
Grace also provided a family for Mephibosheth. He was alone. He was the only living uh, son or offspring of Jonathan. But what happened? Mephibosheth was adopted out of Saul's family and into David's family. He became part of David's family. Like a brother or sister of all David's children. So grace gave him something that he did not have before. But it was extended to him. Grace gave him a family. And when a sinner responds to God's grace, that sinner is immediately adopted into the family of God. Did you know that? Huh? God has a, has a family. And it's a forever family. That's why it's called God's forever family. The Bible says, to those who receive him, he gave the right to become children of God. Even to those who believe in his name. So in other words, those who received Christ trusted him as their Savior and Lord. They become members of God's family. Pastor, I thought we are already uh, children of God because God created us. Isn't it? God created all people, and so therefore, all people are children of God. Not true. See what the Bible says. Only those who receive him, who trusted him, were given the right to become children of God. And this is because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Because of his grace that we can become members of God's family. And that's why we can call ourselves brothers and sisters in Christ. Because we have the same Father, our Heavenly Father. We belong to one family. And it's amazing that this happened in the life of David, which illustrates the real relationship that we have with God. Mephibosheth was a nobody in the house full of somebodies. Oh, there are all the other sons of David was there. David's wife and daughters, his generals, proud and strong and seated, and here comes Mephibosheth, walking in the crutch, with a crutch, coming and being part of that group of people. Takes his place at the king's table with all the rights and privileges as a member of the family. So that's a, that's a wonderful fulfillment. This is not just a dream come true for, for Mephibosheth. It's a dream, it's a reality that went beyond the scope of his dream. Taking a seat, a place at the king's table. That's the power of grace. It takes the lost sinner, changes him completely, and gives him a seat at the Lord's table. Did you know that there will come a day when we will all be gathered on that banqueting table in heaven? You will be seated there. If you are saved, you know that you are going to heaven. You will be seated there in a big banquet. 
all those holy men, Peter and James and John are seated there. Abraham and Moses are seated there. And you will be there sitting too with them. And David over there giving a special number with his harp. Oh my, what a wonderful, wonderful day it will be. If you'll be there. If you have Christ in your heart, you will be there. And it is because of his grace. That's a great fulfillment. And that's because of the power of the grace of God. No wonder it's called amazing. Did you know that? No? No wonder it's called amazing. <coughs> amazing grace. Yeah, let me just close with a few thoughts. <clears throat> Always thank God for his grace. Thank God for his saving grace. You were saved because of his grace. And that's why it's called amazing. But the question now I'd like to leave you is, have you been fetched by this grace? Has its power, promises, and provision been made real in your heart and soul? Not talking about going to church every Sunday. Not talking about reading your Bible or praying. I'm talking about have you experienced God's grace in your life? Well, you know, if you have been saved by grace, then you know what I've been preaching about right now. You know that we have been saved by grace. But if you have not experienced God's grace, I want you to feel that the King, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, is calling you. He's calling you to receive His grace. He is offering you, just like David offered this wonderful kindness to Mephibosheth, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, is offering you His grace, eternal life, wonderful home in heaven in a life full of, and meaningful here on earth. Have you accepted God's grace? No wonder it's called amazing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for speaking to our hearts today. Thank you for the life of David and how you used him to uh, Give us a clear illustration of your grace, of your love, of your kindness to us. And I would just pray, Lord, for each and every one of us that we will not just minimize your grace, but we pray, Lord, that we will uphold it and thank you for how you have used your Son, Jesus Christ, to manifest your love for us and your grace for us. I pray for each and every individual who is here right now. I know that you have a purpose why they are here. But we pray, dear Lord, that may your Holy Spirit continue to speak to their hearts because you know our the situation, you know our own situation, you know our hearts, you know our past, our sin, our shortcomings. But we thank you that in spite of all that, we can always come to you just as we are. And you are there to welcome us and to show us your love and your peace and your joy and your power. For this is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us all rise and let us sing our commitment song. Perhaps you're here today and you have not experienced or you're not 
you've been sure whether you have experienced God's grace. And so I'd like to invite you to, as we sing our commitment hymn, for you just to come forward. We will be here to pray with you. Whatever is your concern, you can always come just as you are. I'd like to ask uh, Brother Lucien, Brother Mark, we can welcome you, we can pray with you, whatever your concern is right now. Please feel free. any prayer concern, feel free to come. You want to experience God's grace, feel free to come. You can come just as you are. especially our visitors, uh, we would like to welcome uh, Santa Ana family once again. Thank you for coming. Uh, uh, si Mr. Mawala, no? Okay. Tell us again their names. Huh? 
You see, where I myself, I'm poor in memorizing names. So what are their names? OK, welcome. Welcome. OK. okay. Welcome, Mami. She's back. Back to health. Yeah. Uh, Sister Dory was uh, hospitalized. She was uh, surgery, hip surgery. And then she went through uh, rehab. And now she's back with us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, she, has a, she has a prime mover here. Huh? <laughs> Praise the Lord. OK. Uh, Maria, will you please introduce uh, your friends here? The baby. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. All your daughters, eh? Wow. All pretty, eh? Karino kaya nagmana. Welcome. Welcome. Thanks for coming, and I hope you can come again. Anyone else that I didn't? Uh, I don't want to miss anybody. Okay. <clears throat> uh, let's move on to our announcements. Uh, our, uh, one of our sister churches who, uh, in Maryland is celebrating their anniversary on Saturday, this coming Saturday, and they want to invite us. That's the reason why they do it Saturday, so that because we know that they know that we cannot come on Sunday. So, if if you are available, uh, I know the address. I know where to go. You can just uh, contact me if you are. You want to come to Phil Am International Church in Maryland. Okay. Uh, second announcement: March 10 will be Golden Girls uh, Day for our FICC women's. There'll be lunch, fellowship, sharing, prayers, followed by pampering and bingo. Okay, so women are all invited, and you're going to fetch those golden girls who are not with us. Hmm? So golden girls is 50 and above. No? Golden girl, you got gold hair. Huh? Oh, they have to qualify. Huh? Okay. <laughs> Okay, okay. <laughs> but mommy is qualified. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. How about Dora? Huh? 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 But you are welcome to the women's. Yeah? You're old. So this will be March 10. That's a Saturday. Uh, remember, uh, daylight saving time will be March 11. Okay, so because that's a Sunday, many people got, get confused of the time. Okay, we're going to follow daylight saving time on March 11. <coughs> we have our Easter Sunday celebration with an egg hunt on April 1st. That's Sunday. FICC Women, Women of Faith Group, they plan to have a weekend at Massanutin Resort on April 20, up to April 22. Please, uh, if you need information, please uh, just approach Edessa or Sister Sally. Okay. There's a fifth Sunday in, uh, in April, so we'll have Hypnal Sunday on that fifth Sunday, yeah, in April. Okay. So that's about it. I'd like to uh, announce to you that uh, 
one person and signify.